Aryo Bhavar, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on your time zone. Welcome to the 14th in the series of webinars hosted by the America Sri Lanka Photographic Arts Society in Los Angeles, California, USA. A member of the Photographic Society of America and International Federation of Photography Art based in France. The objective of the series is to promote environmental conservation in the context of nature photography and ecotourism. I am your host, Sadisha Hulangamu. We are streaming live from Los Angeles, California, USA, and connecting with our panelists, Dr. Sevandi Jayakodi, joining from Sri Lanka, and Dr. Gautami Virakon, joining from the United Kingdom. This week, we hope to explore the vanishing biodiversity and untapped potential of our natural resources. The biggest issue facing the global community today are closely tied to the loss of biodiversity. Biodiversity is the ecological life support, providing oxygen, clean air and water, pollination of plants, pest control, wastewater treatment, and many other ecosystem services. During this webinar, our experts will explain these issues and show us why every one of us should work together to halt the biodiversity crisis. Our first panelist today is Dr. Gautami Virakon, connecting with us from the United Kingdom. Dr. Gautami Virakon is the senior curator in the Department of Life Sciences at the Natural History Museum, London, UK. In that capacity, she manages one of the world's largest lichens and slime moss collections with 450,000 specimens and making the collections available for both scientific and historical research. She has carried out extensive field work of South and Southeast Asia, observing lichens in their native habitats and identified more than 75 new lichen species. As a botanist, environmentalist, and lichenologist, her research interests are focused on the taxonomy and ecology of tropical lichens and the conservation of lichenized fungi in endangered habitats. So I warmly welcome Dr. Gautami to our panel discussion. So this is your opportunity to, to share your presentation. Dr. Gautami, you can start with speech. Never before has the biosphere been under such intensive and urgent threat. Forest clearing rates increased above usual level. Emissions are disrupting the climate system. New pathogens are attacking our health and crops. Illegal trade and loopholes in our system threaten our biodiversity. Therefore, it is important to state an obvious but increasingly forgotten aspect. So we choose our title as Vanishing Biodiversity and Untapped Potential of Our Natural Resources to talk to you today. Biodiversity is the variability of life on Earth. It is measure of variation as genetic, species, and ecosystem level. Biodiversity is not spread evenly on Earth and tends to cluster in hotspots. Biodiversity is rich in the tropics. If we take tropical forest ecosystem as an example, Tropical forest ecosystems cover less than 10% of Earth's surface and contain about 90% of the world's species. Charismatic species in Sri Lanka. Will they survive? 
It's a question. I think it is high time we change our thinking and the entire system. Although Sri Lanka is a global biodiversity hotspot with high endemism, our wildlife tourism is mainly driven by a selected group of charismatic species. But is that all we have? I would like to draw your attention to some other uh, sectors of our Sri Lankan biodiversity. You can see from this table, from this few examples, how rich our diversity is. Ecosystems on the number of Earth's current species, estimate the number of uh, current species, range from 10 to 14 million, of which about 1.2 million have been documented to date. Over 86% have not yet been described. If we take fungi as an example, only 1.5 million fungi are known to date, but estimated number is 4 million. New species are being scientifically named and described each year, but at the same time, others are moving towards extinction, losing the battle against the threat they face. This is also happening in Sri Lanka, not only in elsewhere. A detailed understanding of these two sides of the coin is critical to conserving biodiversity along with the useful characters they hold. The responsible exploration of natural products through advances in biotechnology and other techniques will help us identify and utilize the useful features of our animals, plants, and fungi to fight new diseases and to deal with the emerging challenges facing our country and as a planet. Unfortunately, scientists have been too dependent on too few species for too long. At a time of rapid biodiversity loss, we are failing to access the treasure chest of incredible diversity on offer and missing a huge opportunity for our generation. As we start the most critical decade, of our planet has ever faced and our country has ever faced. It is time to demand nature-based solutions that can address the triple threats. Climate change, biodiversity loss, mainly due to deforestation and food security. So I would like to spend next few minutes to discuss about untapped potential of our natural resources. Here, I mainly take fungi and lichens as examples, since that is my field. By surveying only about 5% of land area, we could document 1,200 species of lichens during last seven years. Predicted number of lichens for Sri Lanka is over 3,000. Each lichen carries two to five chemical substances, but we have only identified around 50 chemicals from 1,200 species known to us. These chemicals have medicinal values. So what we have done to date is not enough. Further, lichens can be classified as producers. They provide food for other organisms, including us. Many small animals, such as squirrels and birds, eat lichens. So the other deer, uh, like samba, lots of snails, they graze on lichens. We don't see it. We don't hear it. Lichens are critical in creating soil. Many lichens are considered as colonizing organisms. This means they are some of the first organisms that can live in an ecosystem that is either new or starting over. They can live on rocks and as they grow, the acids they secrete break down the rocks. 
This makes a significant contribution in the formation of soil. Once soil is formed, other organisms can live in the area and the ecosystems can continue to develop. Lichens also provide important habitat for many other organisms, especially for small creatures. They are an excellent home for insects, arthropods, and other small invertebrates. Birds also use lichens to build their nest. Lichens provide excellent camouflage for small insects and other invertebrates. They have a strong relationships. Nitrogen is a nutrient that is essential for living things. We all know that. Many types of lichens can capture nitrogen from the atmosphere. And then they secrete this nitrogen into the soil where it can be used by plants and pass on to other higher organisms. When it comes to endolichenic fungi, when it comes to endolichenic fungi, I like to take your focus to mangrove lichens. Endolichenic fungi that live on lichens are also important as they produce unique chemicals. The lichens that are growing in hard mangrove ecosystems have produced unique chemicals what we identify in Sri Lanka. These chemicals have showed us promising results. Some of these chemicals can be used even to kill cancer cells. So before cutting any mangrove tree or clearing any mangrove land in the country, we should consider not only bigger animals and plants living associated with these mangroves, but also unknown species like lung, fungi and lichens. We need more research to conduct all our lichens and the chemicals they have. Finding new edible plants to feed world is one of the biggest challenges in Anthropocene. I think growing population in Sri Lanka will need more and more food in the coming decades. There are about 7,000 edible plants in the world, but we human beings only use around 400 food crops. Overlooked and un underutilized plants hold the key to future proofing food production around the whole world. New genetic tools and approaches are increasing in the accuracy with which crops can be bred and pinpointing new applications for fungi, fungi mainly. Their use will be critical to feeding the rising population. These tools will help us to reduce agriculture's damaging impacts, but is threatening our biodiversity and ecosystem services. To make our food system more robust in future, we must diversify the spectrum of species used. So there comes the wild varieties. To predict biodiversity, and safeguard essential ecosystems, we have to use our current knowledge, existing knowledge, and new modern techniques. Rather than helping to reduce greenhouse gases and alleviate energy poverty, some of the methods we currently use to produce bioenergy are actually harming the environment and people, enabling everyone to access clean, sustainable energy calls for locally beneficial energy systems based on diverse plant and fungal feedstocks. Researchers, governments, and industry all have a role to play in making this happen, making this happen in Sri Lanka, because we are over exploiting our water to provide energy. So it is high time that we turn into wind power and solar energy. They are more eco-friendly, friendly for our country. They will do less harm on our biodiversity. Also, it is believed in future, fungi are likely to play a major role within bioenergy. So when it comes to fungi, 
in Sri Lanka. Have we done enough? Do we know enough of our fungi? It's high time we conduct more explorations to discover unknown fungal world within Sri Lanka. Wild ecosystems represent a medicinal cabinet. So we need it. We used it. However, do we need, know enough of them? Plants and fungi have long been used as medicines. This use has contributed to biodiversity loss. Have you seen it? About 700 plant species is believed to be threatened with extinction in the world. This is current data. So new advances in science and technology are important to derive medicines from nature more sustainably. So fungi and lichens and other small plant groups like liverworts, hornworts, mosses, bryophyte, ferns, they have a big sound to make in this. I like to draw, uh, I like to take a, a minute from your time to talk about trees in your urban parks and roadsides. Look at these trees. They provide valuable ecosystem services from clean air to flood protection. So engaging city dwellers with their local flora, fauna and fungi provides part to encouraging greater conservation of biodiversity conservation of biodiversity within urban cities. The Global Strategy for Plant Conservation, GSPC, a program of the CBD, calls for at least 75% of the threatened plant species to be held in ex situ collections by 2020. This is 2020, preferably in the country of origin. Such collections include living plants in botanic gardens and uh, seeds in seed banks. It is important we Sri Lankans take measure, especially focusing our endemics to preserve seeds for our forthcoming future. For sure, there is much to be done in training more taxonomists to allow us to make sense of the vast collection and understand more about our Sri Lankan biodiversity. Regarding living collection in the world, only 107,000 accepted species are grown in botanic garden collections, representing only 31% of vascular plant species. However, 93% of these species are held in temperate parts of the world. As a result, a temperate species has a 60% of chance of being cultivated within the botanic garden network. Whereas a tropical species only has a 25% of chance. Therefore, we need to focus more about ex situ conservation in our botanical gardens in Sri Lanka. Several plant le lineages, including bryophytes, such as mosses, liverworts and hornworts, and some lineages of vascular plants with clusters of tropical genera are still underrepresented in our living collections. Our collections in the herb area need to be readily available for research and education, showing how many specimens they hold, how many are digitized, and how this information is spread across taxonomic groups. Then we researchers can have a good understanding about gaps in our collection data and also enriching our seed banks and introducing more plant groups into our botanical gardens. Working as a community to share specimens and digitized specimen records and images amplifies the power of these resources for addressing our current environmental challenges. However, this needs to be done in a responsible manner. We learn a lot of lessons with research partners and other countries 
to minimize biopiracy. So we should be extremely careful how we do that and the system that we take. With biodiversity loss quickening, we need to set up efforts to name, classify, describe, and protect species before they extinct. If we do not, we will lose our species before understanding their true value. Conducting this work needs international collaboration. There is no doubt about that. And local and global policy framework that encourages the sharing of scientific material. A functioning legal framework through which researchers can access and undertake research and which prevents overexploitation of valuable genetic material, especially genetic material, therefore is critical for our country. I would like to uh, um, hand over the rest of the presentation to Dr. Sivuwandi now. Okay, our, thank you so much, Gautami. Uh, your presentation was very informative. Our next panelist today is Dr. Sewandi Jayakodi, connecting with us from Sri Lanka. Dr. Sewandi Jayakodi was the Assistant Director of the Department of Wildlife Conservation and is a lecturer at the Weimar University. She has an ABSC Honours in Zoology from the University of California and holds a postgraduate diploma in wildlife management and conservation from the Wildlife Institute of India. She also holds a PhD in zoology from the University of Aberdeen in the UK. She has done postdoctoral research at prestigious institutes in Australia, Scotland, and Canada relating to coastal ecosystem management and policy impacts of human disturbance of the ecosystem. She is the chairperson of the National Mangrove Expert Committee and a member of several other environmental related organizations. I warmly welcome Dr. Sewandi to our panel discussion. So the floor is yours, take it away. Hi everyone, thank you very much. Uh, I'll start sharing my screen now. I hope all of you can see my uh, slides. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gautami, for setting the stage for me to continue from where you stop. So I'm going to take you through the vanishing biodiversity and the untapped potential of uh, biodiversity in Sri Lanka. And to start with, I would also like to mention the fact that um, most of us think that we, we here in Sri Lanka, we live in a biodiversity hotspot. But being in a hotspot is not something that we have to boast about because being a hotspot also indicates that our biodiversity is under threat. Therefore, what we really need to understand is we need to be happy about the biodiversity we have, but not very happy about being a hotspot. Rather, we need to come out of that status. The biodiversity of Sri Lanka is something that we can be truly proud of because it, it is really... Um, unparalleled to the biodiversity that is found in the rest of the world. And in that case, I am really happy to use the word non pareil when I speak about the biodiversity of Sri Lanka. So it's a land of non pareil but uh, the question is, have we really understood that it's um, really an uncomparable land? Looking at the biodiversity, of course, the, even before we start talking about the animals, or the fauna, it's always good to look at flora or the plants because plants and the associated other organisms like fungi that Dr. Gautami was talking about makes the foundation for fauna to survive. So if you look at Sri Lanka, 45% of the world's flowering plant families are found in this country as per the latest data from the sixth national report to convention on biological diversity. Not just that, out of that, 3,116 are flowering plants, and that includes 901 endemic species. In other words, 901 species are found nowhere else in the world, but only here in Sri Lanka. 
Now, this uh, rich uh, floral diversity, the plant diversity, has given rise to different ecosystems. And in these different ecosystems, we find various different types of fauna or the animals that are living there. When it comes to the faunal diversity of Sri Lanka, we can, we do have a diversity that we can truly boast about and talk about. Let me start with something quite minute, the freshwater crabs. Freshwater crabs tend to inhabit all the freshwater streams and rivers and even the uh, constructed reservoirs of the country. What is quite interesting about them is that so far, scientists have recorded 51 species of freshwater crabs. And very interestingly, 50, 50 of them are endemic to the country. Now think about it, having 51 species and of that 50 found nowhere else in the world, but here only in Sri Lanka. But what is also interesting is when you look at the distribution of these 51 species in the country, you can see not that they are found everywhere in the country, they are found in different zones. What you see here is as per the sixth national report, the freshwater zone ancient map of the country. And this is exactly why places like here, um, what you see around here, which I have circled in red, um, are quite important because this area harbors some very important freshwater diversity. And this, this is exactly why we need to think before we uh, talk about new roads to places like Horton Plains, because um, once you lose this diversity, it's gone not just from that place, but also from the entire world. When it comes to other minute species like land snails, it's also the same. As you can see, out of 230 species, 205 are endemic to Sri Lanka as per the sixth national report to Convention on Biological Diversity. Just like the snails that are, uh, just like the uh, freshwater crabs that I've been talking about, you can also see here when it comes to land snails, the story is the same. They are not found uniformly around the country. They have their special ecosystems, special preferences accordingly in different um, regions of the country they are found. And that is exactly why we conservationists always talk about in order to protect the biodiversity of Sri Lanka, we need to think about every zonation pertaining to different taxa. And here, as you can see, here in the case of land snails. The diversity of, um, the biodiversity of Sri Lanka is not just because of our endemic species and the resident species. It's also because of um, the uh, species that tend to come to Sri Lanka in order to uh, sort of like spend a part of their life like the migratory species. Now, it's a very classic example here, the birds of Sri Lanka. We, uh, according to the sixth national report, you can see that 510 species of birds are recorded in the country. And you can see of that, 214 are found in the country. The, these are our sort of um, indigenous species of which 33 are endemic. We also have uh, 30 species that are migratory and breeding in the country. And we have 266 species that are migratory and non-breeding. So altogether, you can see we have 510 species. And when you look at species like this, uh, like birds, you can also see when you look at the zonation, the, the importance of the northern part of the country um, for migratory birds, um, especially areas like Jaffna and then over here, Mana with a palliative, um, Putlam Lagoon, all these areas are very, very important when it comes to migratory birds. So it's, we are not just talking about the diversity of the country, but also the diversity of the species that tend to select Sri Lanka seasonally when they do their migration. But then why do we bother about the environment? Do we really need to bother about the environment or rather the biodiversity of this country? Let's spend some time thinking about that. Well, I think we really need to bother the environment basically because number one, we've paid very little attention. All the fauna that I've been talking about 
unless it has the right environment to live, they tend to vanish, they, went, they tend to perish. But you see here is a classic example of most of the land encroachment that you see, uh, mostly in the wetlands, uh, as you can see in here. First you dump your garbage, and over the, over, on top of that, you put your uh, soil and the sand, and then you have new land. So this is one reason why we are losing biodiversity, um, land uh, encroachment and also the land grab, which uh, results in the deterioration of the habitat, fragmentation, and that leads to uh, the um, plus of biodiversity in the country. Uh, it also is also because of the illegal land encroachment, as you can see here, someone coming in and uh, settling in the middle of a reservoir and the catchment. Um, and half the time there are no residents living here, it's near land grab, which is also a major reason why we are losing uh, the biodiversity of this country. Um, from there, we also have from the coast to the uh, heart of the mountains, um, poaching is a big problem. To my right side, what you are seeing is a baby uh, dugong which never managed to see the uh, beauty of the ocean because the mother was killed. She was killed by what we call eagle ray nets or in singular jakotu, so that uh, it was a pregnant mother and that this baby was aborted later on and it never saw the brightness of the sea. And over this side, what you see is a uh, leopard that has been trapped in one of the tea, tea plantations. And most of these animals, even in, even in the case of uh, leopard, they don't survive because of the injuries that they sustain during this trapping. So the problem is that we live in a country, we sit in a country rich, full, fully rich of biodiversity, but then we tend to kill the hen that lays the golden egg. And sometimes we also have the question, I tend to ask the question, it's not just killing the hen, have we even known the hen? Do we know that we do have a golden hen, uh, that, we, that we have a hen that lays golden eggs? That, that's another question. Now to emphasize that fact, what I'm showing you here is a plant that is grown in South Korea under artificial conditions. They have to create all that um, artificial condition using a lot of energy and other resources. Um, but this same plant, which I'm going to introduce you, as you can see, um, Saliconia brachiata, it, it's a naturally low sodium uh, salt and answer to uh, a big problem that the globe, uh, the entire world is facing today, the pressure. And this is one of the 100% plant-based salt. And at the moment itself, this South Korean uh, food technology company has over 30 patents um, under them for this plant. Now this Saliconia brachiata, which is uh, plant, uh, raised under herbarium conditions uh, or, or the um, um, uh, under artificial conditions in South Korea is found like this in Sri Lanka, naturally growing in our salt marshes, very abundant, very colorful, but hardly recognized, never appreciated. That's why I mentioned the fact, are we really understanding the hen that lays the golden egg? Half the time, Saliconia brachiata is found in salt marshes under dry conditions. You may not see the plants. And many a times, developers tend to see these lands as barren land, uh, useless land that can be used for development. But if they wait for us, wait for the right season, this is how the same land is converted into a very beautiful uh, area with the right environmental conditions. But what is important is not just appreciating the biodiversity, but is also important is looking at what this biodiversity has to offer for us. Uh, I think that's how we have to look at the biodiversity at least today, because it, it is our lifeline, it's the most important thing. Uh, we should also not forget what is stolen is also our biodiversity. Earlier, Gautami talked about the importance of conventions. If you know that recently and the last COP of CITES resulted in most of our um, agamids or the lizards being listed under CITES. Why? Basically because 
our lizards are illegally taken from the country and then they are raised elsewhere and the trade is such sometimes in the global market these beautiful lizards tend to fetch a very high price now the question is why are we allowing third parties to profit from our biodiversity while we tend to have them and they are endemic to the country and how do we twist the game how do we change the game plan so that we are the winners of our biodiversity i think that's the dialogue we need today so that is exactly why this baby elephant is should not be looked at from the point of biodiversity this baby elephant should not be looked at from the point that it is a precious baby to the parents or to the herd it should also be looked at from the point of how we can create social and economic gains by conservation as well as at the same time sustainable utilization sustainable utilization is not always harvesting it can, it is it, it is recreation it is using the biodiversity as a market in order to create social and economic well-being for the country and that also includes protecting the lands that should be protected at all costs here in sri lanka if you you know that the mountain zone of the country the real beauty the real biodiversity of the country is not seen basically because a large chunk of it was cleared for tea and also for coffee and rubber plantations but the lands above 1000 meters are important because that's where the cloud forests are that's where the forests that have the ability to trap the fog and the uh, mist and create rain arm in the event that we lose more and more of these cloud forests the mountain forests the 103 uh, ra- uh, rivers that sustain the agriculture irrigation renewable energy of this country will be gone in no time so we have to protect the biodiversity not just because it's important um as plants and animals but it is important because it has the life sustaining properties all the indirect services that we've been talking before uh, coming to that we have to also remember we have a bit of a disparity where the protected areas are and also the endemic species distribution is as you can see most of the protected areas tend to be clustered in the dry and the um at its zone and also in the um, intermediate zone but if you look at the heart of the wet zone you can see that we have very few protected areas but that's where our endemic fauna and flora are. so this disparity got to be closed if we are to talk about meaningful conservation as well as meaningful u- utilization of our biodiversity okay Uh, this is exactly why the the dialogue about other state forests matter because as you can see here in this diagram uh, the other state forests these are the forest uh, patches that that are not s- still protected but have been uh, vested with the under under the jurisdiction of the department of forest uh, what you see here the amount of forest under in hectares under different regions and you can see a vast amount of um, other state forests are found in wet zone um, districts and this is exactly why these other state forests got to be protected and we need to have systems and not just that we i need to also mention that these other state forests if you look at from the point of vegetation type you can see that for an example if you look at the more, uh, moist monsoon forests uh, 11 over 11000 hectares are under other state forests and they are and even if you look at the mountain grasslands which is a mere fraction at the moment even there are 1486 hectares are other state forests so in order to protect the biodiversity and to use it we also need to make sure we protect our other state forests models are already available six tena very clearly indicates what are the landscapes that we need to protect at every cost at all cost in order to protect the biodiversity and to take the 
right use of it. So we need to keep all these ideas in our mind because vanishing biodiversity also vanishing lifeline of the country. Therefore, we should not allow it. And that is exactly why we need to have dialogues like this to make sure that we all, all get together and do it properly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sewadi, for your great presentation. I have a couple of questions to ask. Uh, my first question is, how can Sri Lanka benefit from biodiversity economically? Can you explain for our viewers? I think uh, if you look at uh, the economy of our country, we are not a nation that is still uh, producing cars or electronic gadgets. Whatever we are sending from our country is natural resources or derivatives coming from the natural resources. So the economy at the moment itself depends on the wealth of our natural resources. What is really important is to look at that untapped biodiversity that has an economic potential and to develop models to use it. Um, it's, it's, it's something like this. Now we know that so many uh, natural resources, uh, even sometimes even the species are taken out of the country and they are traded elsewhere, patents are taken elsewhere. It's high time that Sri Lankan scientists, developers, investors think about how do we get into the business of getting the right patent for our products, secure the patent rights and then get into the market and get the economic uh, benefits. Thank you. And how can the disparity between protected areas and where endemic species are found be addressed? Uh, I showed very clearly the disparity. You probably you saw that where the uh, in in the montane zone and the wet zone, that's where most of our endemic biodiversity is. But historically, when the protected areas were created, they tend to be in the dry and the arid zone as well as in the intermediate zone. So the, uh, the way forward is that at the moment itself, we have a large chunk of land uh, that is known as other state forest. And most of this other state forest is found in wet zone, at least a, a larger proportion of it. What is now required is to do some strategic assessment and to look at the the, the, the role each such patch is playing, understand whether it has to be uh, protected, not just for the biodiversity, but also for the services and accordingly create proper um, strategies. It could be protection, declaration them as, declaring them as protected areas, or even co-management, uh, creating mechanisms for the strategic management of those areas. So that disparity can be created through good land governance. Thank you so much for Dr. Sewandi. Now I uh, like to turn Dr. Gautami Virakon. So can you explain how patent work? So, um, so it's, it's, uh... Um, as uh, Dr. Sewandi uh, mentioned, so that it's ha it has become a huge problem, not only within our country, but also globally. So lots of our species has been uh, taken to elsewhere. So one good example known to us is uh, about Kotala Hindutu. So the basic principle for patenting, uh, and, uh, patenting and innovation is that is it must be new involve an inventive step and be capable of development through industry. A patent endows its owner with legal right to exclude others from making, <coughs> using or selling their invention for a defined period of time. So this has been violated in many occasions, uh, the resources that are taken from the country. So unfortunately, there is uh, currently no universal patent available. So parties must therefore file in individual uh, countries for international coverage. The, the rules around use of genetic material, especially genetic material, um, that it's, uh, it's a big issue in everywhere in the world, are guided by Convention of uh, Biodiversity or CBD, 
agreed in 1992 and ratified by 196 parties. So Sri Lanka is one of the parties that, that is there. But it that uh, whether uh, globally these rules are followed or not is a big problem. It's a big question. Um, I would like to take India, uh, our neighboring country, uh, as a good example. So India sets a good example on how to approach patenting. Between 1982 to uh, 1988, Indian government launched a multidisciplinary research project involving um, many institutions called All India Coordinate Research Project on Ethnobiology. Ethnobiology. In 2002, India established access and benefit sharing ABS laws, actually. So Indian Biodiversity Act requires companies to obtain prior approval from National Biodiversity Authority to obtain biological resources for any form of commercial use or patent approval. So there is a process in our country as well. To date, uh, to date authority, uh, up to today, that this Indian authority received about 3,500 applications, so many, and signed over 1,000 ABS agreements, resulting in 2,428 uh, patent applications, of which 729 have been granted. So this process aims to encourage pa uh, patenting of natural-based products while ensuring that benefits generated by the plant, uh, the patent holder, are shared according to ABS agreement. So, so it's a question when our biodiversity is stolen and taken, and you know that even like uh, Dr. Sevanti showed that uh, our agamids, so they are all over Europe. So if I walk into some of the pet shops here in UK, I can uh, identify some of the uh, lizard species that would have come from South Asian countries, especially from biodiversity hotspots like Sri Lanka or South India. So uh, the, the problem is some countries, especially South Indian countries and, uh, uh, and African region simply don't have the infrastructure in place to facilitate patenting. So um, a lot of uh, uh, well, global very rich institutions are involved, unfortunately, very sadly, taking patents using um, some of the underdeveloped or developing countries' biodiversity. So how it works, whether we have ratified in CBD agreements, whether we have ABC laws, I don't think uh, effectively play uh, or effectively play or soundly play the 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 responsibility of patenting. Okay, thank you, Gautami. Uh, and this is the last part we're going to wrap up. Uh, so I I also take this opportunity to thank our two panelists today connecting with us, Dr. Gautami Virukon, uh, who connected from United Kingdom and Dr. Sewandi Jayakodi, who connected from Sri Lanka. So thank you so much. And thank you so much for our viewers. Uh, and I also appreciate all the viewers are joining with us today and we look forward to seeing you on our next panel discussion. So until then, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.